Welcome to Buckeyes Tomorrow Morning for Monday, August 7th. I'm your host, Tom Moore. The Indiana game in 26 days. The game against Michigan in 110 days. Ohio State is in the midst of its fall camp, getting ready for that Indiana game in less than four weeks now. But before we got too far into fall camp, there was a show I really have wanted to do for the last week and just didn't get around to it last week. Wanted to get to it now before we really dive head first into fall camp this week. And that is the show where you get to hear from Big Ten Director of Officiating, Bill Carollo. Every year we get a chance to talk to him at Big Ten Media Days. Every single year I find I learn the most from that interview out of anyone we talk to. We talk to all these coaches, all these players, and I always learn the most talking to Bill Carollo and walk away thinking, wow, that I, I am coming away with so many different interesting things that I learned there. Here's a little hint. Coaches and players are generally trying not to say anything interesting. Bill Carollo, he is just going to shoot it straight. You're going to get some actual answers. You're really going to learn something here. And this one, I'm just going to warn you ahead of time. If you've looked at your podcast player or looked at YouTube, you can already tell this is a little longer than a typical morning show. That's all right. You're going to learn some interesting stuff. It's all going to be a little structured and a little differently than a typical morning show. Because when we talk to Bill, this is not a podium setter where there's a moderator asking questions. It's just a handful of reporters standing around the podium talking to him. So you're going to hear some voices of some different reporters at times. Because everyone's so close and standing just a couple feet away, you're going to be able to hear their voices. You're going to be able to hear the questions. So, so there are going to be times where you're going to hear, I'll set up the answer, and then you hear a reporter ask a follow-up, and then you'll hear his answer again. So it'll be a little different than a typical show, but I'm sure you'll do just fine. You'll, you'll follow along just fine. So one of the things that he talked about this year that I thought was really interesting was the process for coaches who have issues with calls on a Saturday. We've all seen the coaches going face-to-face with the officials and yelling and screaming and Jim Harbaugh up at the postgame podium and after the 2016 Ohio State-Michigan game and holding his hands this far apart because, you know, this is this is how far J.T. Barrett was secretly short that he could see and no one else in the stadium could see, whatever it is. So when coaches have questions, when coaches have issues, what is the process for them to, to, to get answers from Bill Carollo? And what all goes into that? You're going to hear that and then a little bit of back and forth with some reporters here, but you know, as, as always... You'll be able to hear all the questions, so it should all make sense. Well, I ask them, doesn't always happen, uh, ask them 24-hour cooling-off period. Don't call me from the locker room and finish it in the afternoon or it's Saturday night. You know, look at the film. I'm going to look at the film. I did see it, and, I, and I'm gathering film, and I get the coach's film immediately into my office in Chicago. So I kind of have all angles to start with. So I have pretty good, you know, but there could be a reporter, camera guy, that at the game, covering the game, they might have a different angle that we don't have, but I get what TV has, and usually it's sufficient on that. But if they don't like something, um, I ask them to wait. Um, there is a process in place where they can send me, a half, let's say, a half a dozen plays, not just one play. Some of them will call me because they'd rather talk and talk through it. Um, others would just type in <coughs> five or six different plays and say, tell me, is this holding? Is this targeting? Is this you know, uh, a, really a touchdown? What did Replay think on this? And I'll give them written answers back to all their questions. And if they put it, sent it in on Sunday, I'll give it to them within 24 hours coming back. And usually it's the same day. They send it in, Sunday or Monday, they get the answers right away on that. So um, now the plays don't ch- the, the plays aren't going to change, right? Okay, we missed all five of those plays, Coach. Well, not that we bat that poorly of an average, but, but we'll have a couple plays that I uh, certainly... I usually agree with the coaches about 58% of the time last year. So they'll send a bunch of plays in, a little over half. Okay, you're right, coach, but I don't have it. I don't have an official watching that guy over here. Okay, he did. But looking at this angle, he did grab him and he did get away with it, and it was quick. Or he saw it, he passed on it, or she passed on it. You know, so um, they're pretty good. It's it's a little one-on-one for 24 hours, sometimes 48 hours, with the coaches grinding it out with with me, and I answer all of them myself. Do, do, all, do coaches who win a game ever send in complaints or is it only coaches who lost? No, some coaches will never send it in if they lose. Never. And, and they, t- they remind me of that. And then when they do win, you think they're happy. They'll say, <laughs> what about these plays? So they're all different. Some don't send in. Some would just pick up the phone. We have a few co- coaches. Bill, I trust you. But can I ask you about this? Yeah, just call me up. Let's go. And what about that play? And I pull it up. We both look at it at the same time. And... You know, we get a, we get agreement. They aren't always happy with my answers, you know. Um, 
we've had a couple plays last year that we missed. We, we ruled it. No one said one word on the field. Players, coaches, TV. And then we get film afterwards and we keep going on. Replay didn't stop it. And they weren't interceptions. The ball was on the ground or whatever. The, you know, a different angle and you sure looked like everyone played it like an interception. And go, oh, darn it, we missed it. You know, but that should, the flag should go up with replay. I mean, the guys in the field make the call and, I mean, they're done. You know, I mean, they could get together and talk about it, but they're done. Replay needs to have the instincts to say, that's pretty close. Let's confirm that he was in bounds. Let's confirm that the ball didn't skip. You could never see it in any of the replays. But on two plays, I found angles that the ball was loose. One of the most interesting things that he said during the course of that whole conversation was 58% of calls that were questioned by coaches last year, the coaches were correct. So this is not just coaches blowing hot air and, and being mad and blowing off steam. When the coaches question it, a little more often than not, he ends up agreeing with them. So how does those missed calls... How does that get sent along to the officials to help them improve in the future? Oh, yeah. I mean, I take the biggest plays that the coaches send to me, put them on a training tape. By Wednesday, every official in the conference says, hey, we called pass interference. This is not enough for pass interference. I mean, I wouldn't say, and the coach sent it in. I, you don't have to send, they don't have to send any in because we look at every single play. And we grade it, and, you know. But I'm just giving you the numbers with coaches. And they like to vent a little bit, and they want it. But a lot of times they want to know what's through. Is that is that what we want called, Bill? You know, do we want that called? Is it you know? And so I have to tell them, you know, no, it's too technical. He did grab him, but not enough. And that's that gray area that, and the you know the veterans can figure it out. My rookies come in and they're so nervous they're throwing flags, and but I usually will have a you know. Uh, an older guy and a young guy working together on the same sideline. I've experienced, inexperienced, I mean, I look at personalities. I have an outside service that helps me take psychological tests just like the NFL does, and they help me make up crews, decide who belongs with who. Not just is it diverse, a, a, you know, African-American, a white guy, a, a female, or whoever. Diversity is important, but, but I look at experience too. Is that diverse where it's not all old guys, or a bunch of really young renegades that think that they've made it, you know, and they're all too young, you know, you got to balance that out a little bit. If you have been following along with sports at virtually any level, you've heard a little bit about the official shortage. That's something I asked him about because I am coach, I coach at a youth level, I coach in a middle school level, and we are already starting to see it at those levels. It is not quite as easy to get an umpire or an official as it maybe was a few years ago. So, how long until that starts impacting things at the college level? And what are the college officials and the organ official organizations around the country trying to do about it? Yeah, it, it'll take a couple of years, but I clearly see it. If I have just, I don't any geographics or if I have 200 D1 officials applying, you know, in a couple of years, they're going to have 175. And I have, and when, and I have, six division three conferences and one division two conferences and i spend a lot of time with high school this is a full-time full-time job traveling that i'm i'm going to shortage of officials i'm in la starting on doing a clinic saturday morning um out there for and it'd be a four-day clinic and then on the last day we're bringing the nba i represent college football but one person from the nba is coming walt anderson from the nfl is coming we represent every single major sport could be volleyball different we get together to talk about what are we doing about shortages what do we do? And, and I'm just, I said, okay, this is grinded out. We can give elegant speeches. And you'll see in the next 30 days, I hope, we were supposed to do it here. Every one of my head coaches promised that you do a PSA for me about, okay, you want to go to the NFL? We'll help you. You want to be a head coach? I'll help you. But if you don't make those two things, we want you to be a referee, an official. Big 10 head coaches, we're going to have BTN Network go to each campus and they're going to do a PSA for me, and we're going to put it out there in the Big Ten Network. Trying to get, you know, your high school players, someday when, you're, when you take the pads off for the last time, I mean, most of you probably played some sport. When you do it for the last time, you can maybe keep playing tennis or golf, and you can't play football anymore. So why don't you become an official if you aren't, don't want to put, and coaching is a grind. I mean, a lot of hours and hard, you know, sleeping on cots overnight, looking at a lot of video. It's not as bad with the officials, but it's hard to be really, really good at it. 
and and people are blasting you, whether it's youth coaches, I'm not saying with you, Tom, but, but it's usually the fans, it's the parents, you know, and officially Human is a, is a company that's out there that's talking to, to the high school federation here in town and all over the country, clinics about getting head coaches to talk to their parents who talk to their kids. If you cross the line, your kid's not playing on this team. And I, my grandson was just in a, big, a little league game. Um, and a grandpa like me was after, and I wasn't there, but my, my kids were there and my grandkid was playing and uh, the, uh, the umpire walked off the field. He's 13 years old, it was a 10 through 12. He was just a year ahead of the oldest guys there. Really, and it was a playoff for Little League. And, and he had an adult with him, but he was, they got on his case, he took off the mask, put everything down, walked off. I mean, I wish I was there, you know, but to help the kid. But anyways, it's, it's the, the youth don't want to do it. It's hard, you have the hardest job. I got a lot of people wanting to be in the Big Ten. But eventually that number is going to get a lot smaller. It's a real problem. People, I don't want to say don't care, but um, it's not their problem. It's my problem. If, if, if you're there to serve the game, and that's what I try to do, and I want my officials, I mean, they, they, they like what they're doing. And it's challenging. They get, make, make a few bucks. But they're there to serve the game. The people, you guys out there watching the players, it's not the coach, it's not the ref, it's the players. So they, if they know their role, um, and not all of them have it, after three years, most of them leave. You know, the average guy is out in three years. Something else that is a big concern in the officiating world right now is gambling. Gambling is obviously becoming a much bigger thing nationally. It is legal in Ohio now. It's legal in a lot of states now. You're seeing a lot of players getting in trouble now for gambling on games they shouldn't be or places they shouldn't be. Alabama just fired its baseball coach about a gambling situation. How is that impacting officials or is he concerned about how gambling could pa- impact his, his officiating crews you're going to hear that and you're going to hear a follow-up on a little bit of a different angle to that sure we've always tested background checks um, I, I have two services the NCA does it I have a private service we spend a lot of money background checks and all my refs they they'll knock on your neighbor's door Malcolm, if you're working for me every three years I rotate them around they go really deep in your business I can go directly into the bank accounts. They have to sign everything over to me that we have access to go into the bank accounts. So luckily, but if you remember 10 years ago, 11 years ago, Tim Donahue, the, the NBA, I knew, I knew Tim and, you know, made a huge, got himself in trouble, made a big mistake. It hurt. That's that 1% that screws it up for everybody, for all sports. Okay, coach, they missed the call. They aren't. It's not because he's from Ohio and he doesn't like Michigan or vice versa. It's not he missed the call. You know they aren't cheating. I, I was thinking more not so much of the Donahue thing, but yeah. just how widespread the way. Oh yeah. Is well, if, then you get more pressure. And I tell my guys, listen, at Thanksgiving when your brother-in-law comes over to the house, he says, "Is that quarterback? Is he injured? Did he pull a hamstring? I saw him play last." It's oh no, he's going to be okay. I just worked at practice and I talked to the. Well. Innocently, he's giving him information to his family member who's actually legally betting on game. I says, you can't talk to anybody. You're not an expert on medical, expert on the teams. Are they good? Are they trending the right way? You're an expert on officiating only, not anything else. So I, I it's it's a big deal for us. Don't, don't even go there. You're not the expert. I says, well, I don't, yeah, he, well, you saw the stats. You saw the game. Yeah, he looked pretty good. We always ask Bill about big rule changes for com- the upcoming season and the big one this year that you're going to notice is the clock is not going to stop after first downs for the majority of the game. There can be times when it will, but first down and 10 uh, with 10 minutes left in the first quarter, that clock's still going to be rolling. So how much of an impact is that going to have? You're going to hear a follow-up on that, and you're also going to hear another follow-up from our buddy Tony Gerdeman. Well, I think it, it, it impacts the um, the chain crew. <laughs> if they're, they're old and broken down, players or officials they just want to be a you know ringside seat they got to get down there a little quicker you know uh, we're not stopping it so they got to get the things in and work down and then we have mechanics to drop a bean bag we know where the line of scrimmage is um, so that rule will probably take out seven or eight plays from the studies we, we studied about 16 games last year and actually looked at how many first downs and how much time and before we wound it up again after first down and and then in that we probably would lose about seven or eight plays you know, maybe five, you know three or four in offense and defense. So individually, a player's not going to lose a lot of playing time. But in a game, you're going to lose that. We'll probably take three or four minutes. But I think, 
uh, off the game. I mean, that, that's our goal. Um, so I think that it'll be interesting to see what it really does. And we have all the numbers for every year. And, and you know, our game is different. NFL averages 151 plays. We average like 180 plays, 181 plays. So there's quite a bit more plays. And, and, we, and our games are longer because we have more plays. And we, we, don't, we weren't stopping the clock on first downs and a few things. And our half times are 20 minutes. We had to move it from 25 to 20. And NFL is 12. So, but they have it down to three hours and five minutes or 303 to 305 range and ours are like you know 320 to 325 and and just people are impatient you know, people are in a hurry they want the games to go faster so we want to take out dead time so when the guy runs out of bounds instead of waiting and waiting until he comes over and puts the ball down and everyone's set and you know that might be 15 20 seconds every time he goes out of bounds maybe we just get that clip. stop it and then throw it once the ball's thrown in start the clock so we're trying to make it faster um, as far as dead dead time, and we did some things, you know, timeouts and and um, you know, but it's not perfect. But that's where they're at. They're pretty comfortable, and you know, it's it's all about TV a little bit too. Are there different instructions for the refs in these situations? Like maybe you know, hey, get the ball right from the sideline guy. Yeah, we, we we have a whole mechanics manual. I mean, hundred and some pages, and a couple chapters is on, you know. It sounds really simple. How do you get the ball next next play? Who's getting the ball? Who's touching it? If they're in hurry-up offense, if it's raining, if, if it's inside the red zone, uh, you know, it's the center judges, the umpires are coming for the wing. When do we decide one ball only? You know, and we tell the quarterback one ball. You want to go fast? We'll go fast with you. I mean, we're we're you know we're as fast as your players, but we're going to do the best we can. But we want to be really efficient. We don't want we don't want the ball bouncing, you know, and so on. So from that standpoint, we have a lot of mechanics just so we are efficient, you know, to get the ball in. And we're actually, you'll see the clock. The second you go out of bounds, you know, they're going to grab the ball. And once that ball's in the air, even before I catch it and run it all the way into the hash, you know, we're winding the clock now. So you'll see all those plays five or six, five seconds earlier than every out of bounds. I don't know if this would even fall under your purview, but talking about removing six to seven games per uh, plays per game, over the course of the season, that's about a game's worth of plays with more games being added was there talk about yeah we're adding more games but this actually takes away a game but that's what we're trying to measure that we're trying to coaches don't want us to take away plays uh, because they're there to play um, but you know 150 plays for the NFL guy they're happy I mean if they really are playing at the highest level they they don't want to get injured either the more you play and you see you saw us we changed overtime a couple times right and I mean I think Western Michigan had eight overtimes. I think Al or, uh, LSU against Mississippi had eight overtimes, and we changed the rule. That's just too, way too many. It's like 20 extra plays for these kids in this game, and they're tired, and there's a tough game. You know, depends on the elements. So the reality is we're doing some things to try to for player safety and for the long haul, and now you're going to add, what, four more playoff games? Pop. If you go all the way to the champion, I mean, there's 11 teams. I mean, there's they're going to play in a few more games, championship game and playoff games. That's a lot of snaps for a running back or or any player, I guess, banging their heads out there, you know. So, um, so we're we're using that. If we can say five plays here and another ten, if we can get it down to 170 or something, then not that they can justify because TV. I mean, I don't want to say the money justify. I mean, they're going to have the extra games. And they're getting paid for it, and it's a really good entertainment. It's a good product, um, but you got to worry about the kids. All right, we cannot talk about officiating involving the Big Ten this year without talking about that play from the Peach Bowl, the hit on Marvin Harrison in the end zone. Bill talked about it. There were a couple questions be right before I walked up, and I kind of got the end of it, but his consensus was it should have been a personal foul with targeting. So personal foul with targeting, which would be a little bit of a different question, a little bit of a different call than what was made on the field. You're going to hear him talk about it. He agrees that it, they called it correctly on the field, probably should have called personal, personal foul with targeting. And then you're going to hear him talk a little bit about that. And you're going to hear a follow-up from Doug Maurice. Personal foul with targeting. So if, let's say they, for whatever reason, and they did. They took off the targeting. At least it's you got 15 yards hanging and a first down on the play. You know, and it ends up with the same result. But except for the kid, the kid didn't stay in the game on this one. And we have that quite a bit. A personal foul with targeting. 
you know, and if he doesn't um, get him in the, he gets him in the shoulder, but he was sliding quarterback. It, okay, it's a, it, it's a foul. And, and, and this one was, you know, it, it was a very, very tough play, close play. I thought what they did on the field was, was pretty good. And, and there were a few instances throughout the season that they may have flipped it, but I wasn't really comfortable but, with that decision. But really there's two, so there's one discussion about should replay have overturned it. Yes. But if they also had called it on the field originally. Well, they did. They called targeting. Yeah, right, but they didn't a, call the personal. personal. If they yeah. would have called personal foul with targeting, even if they flipped the targeting, the personal foul would have remained. Correct. And you actually think that would have been the proper thing. Yeah, and to I do think that, that we wouldn't have as big a discussion on this. The kid gets to stay in the game, but you know, most people felt that you know knocked the guy out. You know, yeah. got got him. So okay, that play was called targeting on the field. Sounded from his answer there like he was okay with that. He was okay with the officiating call on the field. But then it got overturned on replay. So what did he think about that decision to overturn the targeting call on, rep on replay? And then you're going to hear a follow-up from Steve Hellwagon of Bucknuts. Well, I think the room of the coordinators or the people in the rules committee, they were split on it. So it's not clear-cut. But when you're split, what happens in replay? The call stands, right? We don't have stands in replay. So I think you work your way to that, that answer. In my, my, just my own personal opinion. Um, I, I, if it was my guys, I would have been satisfied what they did in the field, and I, I would live with that call. It was a dangerous dangerous play. It was a you know, foul, and th it didn't end up that way. As they looked at the frame by frame by frame, is it rescinded from targeting because he gets in here as opposed to here? What, what did you see? Well, he did get him there, but there was contact also, if you look at all the angles, there was contact to the head too. So now the question is, was that enough? Or is the 80% going went to the shoulder? Yeah. Okay, well, that's fine if it did. But 20%, it knocked the kid out. Yeah, it's knocked out. So I'm just saying these are really good athletes. And if you look what one of the indicators for targeting is launching, and he leaves his feet and goes up, or he's not wrapping him up with his head up and trying to move his head to the side either. So um, just a really tough call, and we'll talk about it just like we talk about Ohio State, Michigan, first down, and... You guys ask me those questions all the time yeah. every year. You know, was it a first down and yeah. where's the film that shows it and all that? <laughs> so when those officials are evaluating plays, reviewing plays up in that replay booth, a lot of times you'll see them kind of going frame by frame, not just slowing it down, but really frame by frame in that video to make a determination. And sometimes that's useful in terms of figuring out, hey, did a guy catch it? Did a guy get his foot in bounds? Whatever. But with targeting... Can that sometimes maybe maybe give you something that's a little misleading, where it looks like obviously you have it looks like there's a lot more time that elapses on something that was a really bang bang play. So could that frame by frame approach actually be misleading at times when you're viewing a call? Yeah, some plays you actually have to Tom look at um, frame by frame, and some I tell my guys never look at frame by frame. Put on the regular speed, the line feed we call it. Regular speed, not speed, regular speed. And it's usually a catch, no catch. Because it, if I slow a catch, no catch, I catch it, it's moving slightly, and now I really slow it down. Oh, I have it. Now I've taken three steps with this. You know, yeah, it's a problem. It looks like that, that he caught it and he fumbled it. On regular speed, it's in and it's out. We want incomplete. You know, hang on to the ball. You know, so, but other ones, like whether he's in or out of bounds, or, you know, if he went, did the defender commit, before or after the quarterback started to slide. That's a tough one because the quarterback in, in college, the quarterback wants to get every single yard. NFL, they're sliding five yards before the first down. They don't, I mean, yeah, they, they protect, and they're smart from that standpoint. Our guys are running too much and it's hard for our guys to get the last second they bail out. And you're coming in trying to, you know, you're trying to tackle the guy and then they bail out on you. And, and then did he, who hit who? You know, I mean, the defender's going to come in. Was he committed? If he was come in, committed to make that uh, tackle, if the quarterback slides late, you can't ever hit him in the head, but you might not have a, a late hit. You might not have that personal foul with targeting on that one because if he's clearly late from that standpoint. So uh, I like the idea on these plays. It happens so fast, and it's a loud collision, and it's a violent, dangerous play. I'm okay that leaning toward give him a personal foul with targeting. And if it's not targeting, 
and replay can prove it. Forget the plays we just talked, but if they can prove it, fine, throw it out, penalize them. And finally, this is something that Ryan Day has kind of talked about in the past that they may be kind of losing the plot on targeting a little bit, where you get so into the nitty gritty details and the the minutia of the rule that you're you're kind of losing the forest for the trees. When you're looking at it frame by frame, do you sometimes just lose the intent of the rule where the intent of the rule is to keep players safe? And if you're going frame by frame, you can overturn something that ended up being the kind of injury that caused them to make the targeting rule in the first place. And some stuff, you can, if you step back with an unbiased hat on, you know, and just say, well, that's not football. That's not what we want. Would you, would you, want, would you want your player to do that in practice to your guy? Oh, no, no, we wouldn't do that, you know. You know, or onside kicks, you, they don't even practice onside kicks, but they want guys to get blown up out there. That's, you know, you'll get a targeting on that too, you know, yeah, yeah. because trying to catch it. So it's it's kind of a tricky business because it's, it's subjective and it is a gray area. I mean, let's take a simple play. Is this hold? Yeah, he's got him. Got him by the jersey, but he, you know, he's not beat yet. He's moving his feet. You know, is that enough to call, is that enough for, or is that, was that his intent really? And if you use some just common sense step back, you know, I said, well, that's, that, that's not good for the game. You know, we, yeah. we want to get that kind of stuff. And that's what targeting started, you know. Well, believe it or not, that was just a portion of the conversation with Bill Carollo. I ended up talking to him for a little over 45 minutes, I think. Again, always really, really interesting stuff. If you want to find the whole, the whole conversation, you can find that on our YouTube channel at youtube.com slash Buckeye Huddle. There's plenty more stuff. Tony Gerderman asked him about the XFL's kickoff rule, for example. A little more nitty-gritty stuff on some different rules and changes to chop block rules in the last couple of years. All sorts of really, really interesting stuff that these are not necessarily questions you woke up this morning thinking you wanted the answers to. But at some point this fall, there will be a call in a game and you can say, aha, I remember when Bill Carollo talked about that. And there's the answer. So, again, hopefully you guys enjoyed that show. I know I always love talking to Bill. I we, when we're dividing up our interview assignments at Big Ten Media Days every year, I always hold up my hand and say, I will go talk to Bill. I will go do that. I'll get that whole interview because I always feel like that's something that you get really good, interesting answers on a bunch of stuff. So hopefully you guys enjoyed that as much as I did. Thank you guys all for joining us. We'll talk to you tomorrow.